Yep. All right. There's a reason why one's orange and one's black, so we can tell on the mixer which one is which. All right, God in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this great day. Thank you so much for your love, your kindness, and your goodness. Thank you so much for this place. Thank you so much for Keith, his faithfulness, uh, doing this week after week after week after week, regardless of who shows up, Father. Thank you so much. Uh, God in heaven, um, thank you for your kindness, humility. Uh, the humility that you give us. Thank you for the uh, gentleness that you give us and patience. Thank you for your patience, especially, Lord. And uh, Lord Jesus, please help us to uh, um, bear with one another. Help us to be gracious towards one another. Help us to forgive each other. Uh, God in heaven, help us to um, help us be uh, to embrace this perfect bond of unity. Help us to embrace it, Father God. It is. I know all of us would agree that we can't actually do this on our own, Lord. We need your spirit. We need your spirit within us. We need the power that you give us to be able to, to do this sort of thing. Um, in the flesh, we couldn't. In the flesh, our motives would be way off. So, God in heaven, please uh, fill us with your spirit and help us to embrace these things. Help us to be thankful. And, uh, Father God, I pray that... Uh, the peace of your son, Jesus Christ, uh, will rule in each one of our hearts. Please speak through Keith now and help us to learn from you, be transformed by it, and uh, spread this to others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So last week we actually looked at verse 12 and then um, ended up not covering verse 13. So we're going to continue on with verse 13. We're, we're going through again... Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Um, can you start off, Wayne, and we'll read yes, around. And uh, you'd like me to read one verse ver or two? Verse or? 12, just one, and then we'll just read around. Okay, here we go. Colossians 3, verse 12. So, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Even with one another, and graciously forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. Above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay, so um, as, we, as I mentioned, we looked at the, this list of things that Paul exhorts the Colossians to do in, in verse 12, which he talks about having a heart, putting on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And in that, he was talking about our emotions and how we should be towards each other. Um, and then in verse 13... He starts off, and, and, and um, the first phrase in that is bearing with one another and graciously forgiving each other. Notice he's tying bearing and forgiveness together here. And there's a reason for that. Somebody want to read Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, I, a prisoner in the Lord, exalt you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. Be diligent to keep the unity of the spirits in the bond of peace. Notice here, Paul is also talking about this. And, and remember, in Ephesians chapter 4 starts off Paul's um, practical part of the book. 
Remember, he breaks his books up, it seems like the first half is usually steeped heavily in doctrine, and the second half is, is practice. Um, Lehman Strauss puts it, the polemical and the practical, um, for alliteration purposes. But um, in this case, notice he's saying, because of who you are, this is how you should live. That's what the therefore is getting at. Paul is looking back at chapters 1 through 3 where he talks considerably about that. And we're seeing a similar thing in chapter 3 of Colossians where Paul is looking back at chapters 1 and 2 which he again talks a lot about who we are. And he's very strong on the doctrine of our faith. And now he's talking about the practice of our faith. And notice he says here, bearing with one another, graciously forgiving each other. And Paul says the same thing in Ephesians. He says, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That's the same word. Um, somebody want to read Second Thessalonians 1, 4. So that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Notice here, he's saying your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. That's exactly the same word he's talking about when he says bearing one another or bearing with one another. Yeah. You could say with all humility and gentleness, with patience, enduring with one another in love. It's the same word. That's a hard thing to think about, you know. Most of the time, we, we don't try to admit the fact that those whom we love most, we have a tendency sometimes to be very impatient with. And sometimes we have to learn that I got to endure that impatience and I got to learn to be patient, even though I, go ahead. You, you were going to say something. You no, that's okay. I, I just appreciate the fact that you're throwing in some, uh, some uh, application here, uh, some examples. I was, uh, had a wonderful visit with Dwayne Wade uh, early, early in the week, and uh, we were just kind of talking about life, and of course he's still struggling, obviously, with the loss of his wife. And one of the main reasons is that is he lived with her for 74 years. Right. So we are talking about the idea of... Um, Oh, your marriage must have been perfect, right? And he starts laughing and goes, of course not, <laughs> you know? But there was this idea of, look, uh, you, don't, you don't throw away people. You, you endure with one another. Right. And it's something that the world has, you know, just the world meaning Christians and non-Christians, just, just in general, the world uh, just has a real tendency of just throwing throwing. Even, even in the Christian church today, we consider marriages to be disposable. Now, I understand there are issues, and there are times when that's the only resolution. I'm not saying that that's not the case. But if we are truly to endure one another in love, we don't treat our relationships as if we can just throw them away. We have to understand that if God truly brought us together to be married, there is this reason we, why we are together. And sometimes there's this reason why we may not see eye to eye, but we can figure out how we can still love each other how we can still learn to be patient. As a matter of fact, as Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, or, or basically says, 
tribulation works patience. Paul says we glory in tribulation. And this idea of enduring with one another in love, bearing with one another in love, that involves tribulation. Truly it does. So when, when we are in that sense of bearing with one another, we are learning patience. As a young Christian, go ahead. I was going to say, it's just so nice that Christ has put us into this Christian fellowship. Right. Because what a safe environment we have to practice these things. Yep. You know I mean? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, that is an amazing thing, that, that we can learn patience. I remember when I first started... Um, Looking at that, I made Romans 5, 3 through 5, my life verse, when I was about, just shortly after I got saved. Um, shows you how perverse I am, that I would take a verse like that and make it my life verse. But one of the things that I learned early off is, if you ask God for patience, expect tribulation. It's as simple as that. Because that's how God teaches us patience. You know that prayer, I want patience and I want it now? It's never going to work. Patience is learned over time. And it's learned through great difficulty. And it has to do very clearly in this area of Bearing with one another. Of enduring one another. Because that is the key element of learning patience. God put us in a position to love someone. Whether it be a spouse, a brother, a sister, a father, a son, a daughter. Or a friend. God calls us to love each other. That's one of the key issues that we're going to be looking at today. But he starts off by saying, first of all, bearing with one another and graciously, notice, forgiving. He ties those two together very closely. Bearing and forgiveness. Now, when he's saying this about forgiving, it's not because we're forgiving for no reason. We're forgiving because we've been hurt. We're forgiving because someone has done something to us that is clearly wrong. But we are still to forgive because we also do things which are clearly wrong. And we also need to be forgiven. That's why the Lord's Prayer says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness is that idea that I need to have a heart of forgiveness in order to expect forgiveness from others. Somebody want to read Romans 8.32? He who indeed did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Okay, so again here, we're seeing here this idea of giving grace. That's what forgiveness is about. Giving grace grace. And it says here, he who indeed did not spare his own son, we deserved wrath. We still deserve wrath. But he gave grace. And that's what he expects of us to do to each other as well. And then he continues on, specifically with the practical, 
and, and in verse 13 continues and says, He who has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. So Paul is appealing this idea of forgiveness. He, he calls out the beginning of forgiveness in that first phrase. And now in this phrase, he's going deeper into that and saying, here's why. Why is it that we need to forgive? It's right there. As the Lord graciously forgave us. Notice Paul when he says, he who has a complaint against anyone. He's not talking about imagined complaints. He's talking about legitimate complaints. But he also says, the Lord has a legitimate complaint against you. And he graciously forgave you. Go and do thou likewise. Somebody want to read Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all, let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away for you along along with all malice malice it must add be kind to one another tender hearted gracious forgiving each other as oh, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you so again, we're seeing the same theme in Ephesians. As God forgave us, we are to forgive others. He says, put away. And notice here, he starts off by, first of all, talking about the emotions that are normally stirred up when somebody does something wrong, when we're hurt. This is the first reaction of the flesh. Look at it. Bitterness. Anger. Wrath. Shouting. And slander. We harbor things in our hearts. And don't forgive. And it leads to bitterness. And the end result, if you will, if, if you notice this kind of seems to be this progressive thing where it ends up where we just start bad-mouthing the person that's hurt us. Paul says, put that away. Instead, forgive. And then in, continuing on in verse 14, Paul says, Above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now, I wrote out the Mounts translation. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I pronounce it Mounts, Mounts or whatever. But you know, on, Bible, Bible, on Bible Gateway, they have this Greek interlinear translation and it covers it and it, it follows the Greek, but it, it has the Greek and then it has the English. And this one is slightly different. He says, and cover all these virtues with love, which is the bond that leads to perfection. Notice, above all these things, put on love. Put on love, sort of like clothing. But this is going to be rather interesting here when we look at something that I saw as I was looking through this verse about putting on love. 
Uh, somebody want to read uh, 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound thinking and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable with one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Notice here, he says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. That idea of keeping fervent and above all, that's the same basic phrase that he's talking about here. And notice, though, that what he says, why this is so important. Keep fervent in your love because love covers a multitude of sins. That's what Jesus did on the cross because of his love. John 3.16 says it so clearly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And what was it he did? He paid the price for our sins, and therefore our sins are separated from us as far as as the east is from the west. And am I so glad that the Bible says the east is from the west? Because it doesn't say as the north is from the south. And you think, well, what's the difference? Well, you go north at one point, once you reach a certain point, you start going south again. So there is a finite distance between the north and south poles. But you go east, and for all eternity, you can keep going east and never start going west. Or if you go west, for all eternity, you can keep going west and you'll never start going east. So as far as from infinity in the eastern direction to infinity in the western direction, I don't know if I've got my hands right. Depends on orientation, but as far as Infinity is from infinity. That's how far he separates our sin from us. There's, I mean, how much more can you cover sin than to just separate it? And that's the example he set for us, and that's what he wants of us. That we should love one another in the same way. Matthew um, 8.24. I'm using the um, ESV translation here because it says something here. Matthew 8.24, and it says, And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. Now this word swamped, that's the same idea that's here, putting on or covering. So when it talks about here, put on love or cover these things with love. It's the same word that Matthew is using about the boat being swamped. In other words, it's just not a little tiny teaspoon. It's so much that it just swamps. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He just washed our sins away. In an overpowering way. That absolutely nothing could resist. And that's the same kind of power... Now, can I love that way? No. No one can, except God. But he works in me both to will and to do his good pleasure, which means he gives me the desire and he gives me the power. So if I allow him to work his love through me, that love will swamp. Not my love. His love. 
My responsibility in this is to obey. His responsibility is to actually do the work. He does it through me because I obey. Go ahead. I was talking to a buddy of mine on the road, and he was telling me about this story about an Amish community. And whether you agree with everything with the Amish or not, I mean, that's not the point. The point was is there was a man uh, who kidnapped and killed and uh, assaulted one of their daughters. Okay? And they do this thing where they, they, they do what's called a wake, where they put a coffin in their house and they just mourn for up to like five days or a week, whatever it takes for them to get through that process. And people just come in and they sit with them as they grieve this big loss. I mean, it could take, take, take a while. I mean, to the point of, you know, the whole, the whole nation of Israel mourned Moses for like 40 days, right? Anyway, after the trial was over, about a year later, and he was convicted of the crime, the Amish community wanted to send the man who committed a crime a message. After they had grieved it all, they wanted to come to a place where their love swamped this situation, and they sent him a message that they forgave him, and their only desire was for him to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, to know God, you know? And Nick, my buddy Nick and I were thinking about it, and we're like, you know, tearing up down the road because if anybody assaulted and killed my daughter, I mean, would it take me a year to forgive? I mean, it would probably take a lot longer than that, you know? But it's just a good testament, a good challenge. Right. You know, that they got past that, and they... they they found love on the other side of it in order to forgive that person of that great sin. You know? Amen. As a matter of fact, in the natural realm, natural me, it would take me more than a lifetime to forgive a sin like that. Yeah. Them, <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, that... Um, that is about the natural reaction. You know, after I kill him, then I'll forgive him. But uh, no, um, that's not what God wants of us. He provided the means to be forgiven. Look at all the people he forgave in history. People we know were forgiven. David himself. A man who God said, this is a man after my own heart, and yet an adulterer and a murderer. And what's interesting is the Bible doesn't pull any punches about people's sin. Puts it right out there for everybody to see. A man with feet of clay. And yet God forgave him. Gives you great hope, doesn't it? Oh, I wasn't as bad as David. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you murdered someone. Jesus says if you, were, if you hate someone, you've already murdered them in your heart. So you're no better. And notice something that one of the things that we're supposed to put away is hatred, anger. That's murder. Somebody want to read First John 2, 5? But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. I love this, that John is saying this, that whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has been perfected. This idea of being perfected, and that's something that we see here, um, this, this um, in the Munz translation, we see here that this love is a bond, 
that leads to perfection. Or it says here, put on love in the, the LSB, it says, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. This is not the idea of being fully 100% pure. That's not what perfection is talking about here. It's talking about maturity. It's talking about coming to completeness. It's the bond that completes. As a matter of fact, Hebrews also talks about this, this word perfect here. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. That's the same word. So we can say that, as Muntz puts it here, which is the bond that leads to maturity? In other words, this love brings us into a mature state so we can act like adults. And that's what, what, what the author of Hebrews is getting at here. Press on to maturity, perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance. Peter talks about that, about always going back to the milk and not getting at the meat. And that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about here. Press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. In other words, we need to grow. And that's what this idea of putting on love, which is the bond of unity. And you'll also notice in Ephesians 4, verse 3, and I, I put a note back to that somewhere in here. But this Ephesians 4, verse 3 ties back into this idea also, where it talks about this bond of unity where we see being diligent to establish the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Is that what it says? No. It says being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There's a big difference between establish and keep. See, it's not my responsibility to make the peace. That's what Jesus did on the cross. When he died, he made both one. He established the peace by destroying the enmity, even the law of commandments. He made peace. Our responsibility by following Christ is to keep the peace. And it's important for us to understand that sometimes words are very important as to what's there. That we can't just make tiny little changes which sound nice. But sometimes words have real meaning in in what's being said here. And when Paul says, keep the peace, he means keep the peace. There's no way we can establish peace. That's already been done. But it's important for us to work at keeping the peace he's already made. It's impossible for me to do what Jesus did on the cross. You're 100% right. Like we're playing with words a little bit. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, it talks about blessed are the peacemakers. You know, obviously, we're not dying for the sins of somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Right. But sometimes in a very real way, we need to make peace. 
with our brethren in the blood of Christ or because of the blood of Christ. Right. Like, not to war one word against another word, but either way, it's all about Christ and he offers right. peace. It's about us keeping the peace between the brothers, however we make that happen. Right. And, and, and making the peace in that sense is truly, in this case, I, I, I believe, it is, has everything to do with the gospel. Has everything to do with that good news that Jesus died, that he established the peace, and the way we make peace is we proclaim that peace to others. That's how I am a peacemaker. I proclaim the peace to those who do not understand that. That they may then come to understand. It's not on me. I can't make myself right before God. Being a genuine peacemaker in terms of dealing with the lost. And we're going to end with this section here. I know I get a whole nother page. We'll, we'll continue that next week. <laughs> but being a peacemaker, as the pastor brings up here, which is very important for us to understand, proclaiming the gospel is being a peacemaker. Because what we're doing is we're saying, peace is, has been made. As a matter of fact, if you look at Paul's epistle, You see that he starts off grace and peace. And the order is very important here. Grace comes before peace. When Jesus died on the cross, he established that peace. And being a peacemaker is just that. Telling others there is grace. You don't have to be at war with God. God has made the peace. It's up to you to receive that and no longer be at war with God. That's how I can become a peacemaker. I don't make peace. I proclaim Peace. He made it. I proclaim it. When a person receives it, I am a peacemaker because I have preached the message. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, and the word comes through proclaiming it. That's how I am a peacemaker, proclaiming peace. It's been done. God has finished it. As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Peace reigns between God and those who receive his grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace and your kindness. We thank you that you have provided a means for us to be forgiven. You've provided a means for us to be made into new creatures, for us to be peacemakers, for us to keep your peace, which you established on the cross. We cannot have your, the peace of God without being, first of all, at peace with God. And we just pray that you'd help us to understand that we can have this peace because we have been made at peace with you. That we can come to you boldly with confidence because you loved us. Because you sent your son to die for us. And when he rose from the dead, he provided life everlasting to those who believe. 
In Jesus' name, amen.